What is up everybody, it is Auk here, back with another video, and in today's video we're going to be going over the Wrath of Cenarius, which is the best in slot ring for Paladin AoE farming in pre-patch, TBC, and even into Waddle K. It is so good, it is also good for mages and warlocks and things like that, but I'm going to be going over in this video exactly how to get their ring, why you should get it for your Paladin, and why it is so good and is going to be so good in the Paladin AoE farms. Even if you have a Horde Paladin that you're going to level up in pre-patch, I would highly recommend going for this ring. The reason why most people don't know about it or most people don't go for it is because it is a grind and a half. It definitely is going to take some time. It is going to take some resources, some gold, but hopefully if you could do it with a group of friends or get some Paladins who also want to get it along going with you at the same time, you can really speed up the progress. I didn't see any good guides though out on YouTube, and so I wanted to make a guide myself basically walking through my progress with getting through this on Twitch. So if you guys haven't checked out the Twitch yet, definitely check it out at twitch.tv slash Arleus. Feel free to ask me any questions you have and going through the optimal strategy that I've kind of derived by going through it myself. This ring though, guys, is 100% worth it. So I highly recommend sticking around and getting this ring for yourself. So real quick, if you didn't know, what is the Wrath of Scenarius? It is a ring that gives a chance when your harmful spells land to increase the damage of your spells and effects by 132 for 10 seconds. So it's 132 spell power buff. Now this doesn't sound crazy right off the bat until you know that it procs off Consecration. So imagine being in SM and having this ring, dropping Consecrate on 75 mobs, it is going to proc. You're nearly going to have 100% uptime when you're doing these AoE farms in pre-patch and TBC, especially once you get into strat and things like that, where you just have a pure 132 spell power from one item the proc chance i believe is five percent so as long as you're killing more than 20 mobs you in theory should proc every single consecrate it is absolutely incredible okay so to properly test out wrath of scenarios what we want to do is we want to basically compare our consecrates damage with it and without it so wrath of scenarios is going to give 132 spell power so i'm on the beta so we can have a prop appropriate 95 percent coefficient on consecration and I'm going to test with zero spell damage and then as close to 132 as I can possibly get so we can kind of see the difference between the spell power uh, between Consecrate with and without Wrath of Scenario. So if you run into Stockades, we aggro one mob and just drop down Consecrate, we can see that each tick of Consecrate is 48 damage. It's ticking every single second. So if we run out, then we need to get up as close to 132 spell power as possible and see the difference. So here we have 131 spell power. Obviously, it's pretty much going to be the exact same thing as Wrath of Scenarius proc, and you can see we go from 48 to 63 and 64 damage, so 63.5. So maybe that, maybe that extra one spell power will put it up to 64. But you can see there a 16 damage per tick difference. Imagine that over the course of about a 30 second to minute long AOE farm, you can kind of see just how big and how much extra damage we're gonna be able to pump out with Wrath of Scenarius. So the quest is broken out into a few different grinds. As you can see here, the champion's battle gear, the first grind is combat badges, logistics, tacticals, and mark of Scenarius, which is a grind itself, and then Scenarian Circle Exalted. And so I wanna walk through how to do each of these the most efficient way possible. Before we jump into that, you actually have to figure out how to get these badges. So out in Silithus, if you come to Wind Calder Caldon, there's a quest called Field Duty. And so field duty is basically a quest where you're asked to go either to your horde or alliance respective location and go get your field duty paper signed. The way you get them signed is by spawning a mob that basically tries to kill the captain there. As long as you save the captain and you don't let him die while killing the mob, I highly recommend having healer just to keep him up and heal him. You can then turn in your signed field duty papers run back to here, turn it back in, and then run back. Make sure though, whenever you're going to go do this, that you click the unsigned duty papers immediately because that prepares the prepared duty papers and then also puts a three minute cooldown on being able to click them again. There's actually a way, if you go really fast, to be able to get two papers in one go. So I'm doing this on the beta just to be a little bit quicker with it, but it's the same exact way on live. It's gonna be slightly easier on the beta because you do have Pursuit of Justice with this spec. And so I'm able to go a little bit faster, but on live you could still do it and still have a margin of error about five to 10 seconds. Definitely recommend having Questy as well, just because it'll help you turn in the quest quicker. But basically you kill this big bug 
And as long as you keep the captain alive, you're good to go. So you can damage the big bug, but the most important thing is making sure that you keep the captain alive. As long as he stays alive, you're able to turn in the quest to him afterwards and then run back to Scenario and Hold. Your goal is to run back to Scenario and Hold as directly as possible and as fast as possible so that when you get back, you can talk to Win Caller Calden and choose your logistic, tactical, or combat mission. Now make sure you know which you're going to choose in advance so that you can turn it in and then get the field duty again. As soon as you get the field duty quest again, don't dismount just run back to the location and once you get back dismount spam click on the prepared field duty paper so you can turn it back in and then turn it into the captain as long as you're efficient with this even without any mithril spurs or speed enhancements or anything like that and no pursuit of justice you'll be able to actually turn in two at that point you run back again to win calder calden get field duty again go back kill another one of the bugs and just rinse and repeat now, there's two things to keep in mind. The first one is that you could wait until the captain despawns then and then start it up, start the RP event, run back and then run back and the mob will not be dead and the captain will not be dead so you can heal him in time when you get back. So you could do that to be as efficient as possible. But if you're going to do that, make sure that you click the field duty papers as fast as possible because they do have that three minute cooldown before you can click them again to get them prepared and so if you wait too long you won't be able to have them prepared to be able to turn into the captain and then you're not going to be able to double up every time you run back for field duty to turn it back into wind caller kaiden and then obviously run back to get the next one and just keep on getting these badges really quickly or getting these assignments really quickly you're going to be able to choose combat logistics tech or tactical assignments the combat assignment will give you something to open with four different combat assignments logistics and tactical will each give you one individual assignment. The thing is that the logistics and tactical will both give you follow-up quests when you finish that first assignment, whereas combat will not. So combat giving you four just means you can stack up as many of the combats as possible. Logistics and tactical just means you're gonna turn them in in the future. Now what I recommend doing is starting off right off the bat getting four combat assignments and trying to fill out your quest log with all the different killing assignments. Basically, combat says go into the hives uh, in, in Silithus and kill the mobs. And it's basically 30 of each type of mob. And so what you wanna try to do is get all the combat assignments so that you can basically have every single mob that you'll need to kill. By the way, you also need a very empty quest log before you start to do this because you will have 20 quests pretty much at all times that you're gonna be doing at once. So definitely make sure to empty your quest log before you start this. So start off getting four of the combats. Once you get four, that should give you 16 quests. Now, depending on how lucky you were with those quests, maybe you need to go for a fifth, but you want to make it so that you have four quests for each of the hives. And that's basically your goal right off the bat. As soon as you do that, I recommend getting five tactical and five logistic assignments. So if you're very fast running back and forth, this is a total of 15 of these assignments, which means killing the large bug at least seven and a half Okay, eight times. Having five of the logistics and tactical though would be so nice because it will mean that at any given time you'll have five that you can complete, which sometimes they in a way overlap. The reason why you wanna get combat in the first place is because tactical, for example, can send you into a cave where you're killing some of these Hive of Ashi or Hive Regal or Hive Zora mobs anyways and finishing off your combat assignments while actually completing your tactical assignments. So one of the biggest tips that I can give is to stack up all these assignments before you actually get started with trying to get the badges themselves. After you gather up all those quests, you kill that mob, you know, eight times and you get all the different assignments that you open up and get in each of your individual, you know, briefings, your bags and quest log might look something like this, where you have a crap ton of these briefings and then you have a full quest log. But that is what you want. That is honestly what you want for this, guys. You guys want to have all of your combat quests at all time. Because you can see here that I'm a 7 out of 30, 13 out of 30, 1 out of 30, 10 out of 30, 7 out of 30, all just from doing my tactical quests. So I'm now 24 badges into tactical and I have all of these combat quests where I've already made my way through part of them. So now it's gonna be a lot easier just to finish them. So I highly, highly recommend getting all the combat quests first before you start doing your tacticals. So this part is probably the most complicated aspect of the quest itself. There's a bunch of different briefings that you could get, and eventually you'll memorize what each one of those corresponds to. Some of those briefings though, you can only get as follow-up quests. So as I said before, with tactical and logistics, once you turn them in, you get a follow-up assignment. That follow-up assignment will give you another one of these briefings. 
The important one to look out for is tactical task briefing number five. That is going to give you the quest four dukes, which is going to ask you to kill these four dukes, but then we'll reward you with the mark of scenarius. Why is that important? The mark of scenarius is what you need as the additional quest item. Each of these quests to get one of these powerful items from doing these kind of grinds, mark of scenarius or earth strikers, things like that, require a specific item. And so this one, the specific item is the mark of scenarius. Hence, Wrath of Scenarius. Kind of makes sense, right? So what you're going to want to look out is for tactical task briefing number five. With that in mind, even if you get 20 of the tactical badges, so you in theory are done with that part, you still need to continue to do tactical tasks to try to get the follow-ups to try to get these briefings. Now, as far as the numbers themselves go, the lower numbers, they, they all correspond to different things, but there's three overarching quests. Kill the lesser elementals, go into the hives and scout for an individual person in the hives or kill two patrols. And they're actually laid out very nicely once you kind of understand the different quests so that different numbers will, you'll be able to easily tell what the quest is going to give. So for one through four, that is going to be killing one of the elementals. And I'll show you guys this in a second. Number five, we just talked about with the wrath of scenarios, six, seven, and eight are going to be going into hives. 9 and 10 are going to be killing patrols. So that's the easy way to think about it. Now, obviously, there's different hives you're going to have to go into and things like that, but that's a very easy way just to kind of get an idea of what individual tasks you have. So 1 through 4, elementals, 6 through 7, or 6 through 8, hives, 9 and 10, pats. So for number 1 through 4, we have to kill the lesser elementals. So at each of the twilight camps, there's different kind of these wind stones. And so you're going to see these stones right here. There's the lesser stones, medium stones, and then the large stones. Mediums are dukes, so we'll need those later in the quest. But for the lesser stones, that's going to give us these Templars, which is going to be the number one through four. There's four different types of Templars. There's rock, fire, water, and air. They have different names, obviously, than that. But basically, your goal is to try to stack up a bunch of these tactical assignments so that hopefully you could need multiple of these elementals at once. If you're doing each individual tactical assignment one by one by one by one, what's probably going to happen is even if you get these elemental spawns, you're going to need earth and fire is going to spawn or water is going to spawn or something like that. So that's why it's so nice to kind of stack up a bunch of these quests at once so that if you need, you know, three out of the four elementals, you have a good chance of getting one of them to spawn. The way that you get one of them to spawn is by putting on the twilight gear. And so from these twilight camps, there's the twilight gear. You have to put on a full set and then that will spawn one of these elementals. Here you can see that we got the Azure Templar, which we fortunately both needed. And so we were able to get one of these assignments done. With that in mind, what I recommend also doing is buying a bunch of these sets before you get started, just so you can spawn a bunch of these guys. Each time you kill one, they will drop an Abyssal Crest as well as chance for some other items. See about those Abyssal Crests, you can use them later uh, if you don't want to buy them off the auction house. That's basically the Elementals. They're probably the best and the easiest, especially if you have a couple people. You can solo them as pretty much any class. They just have like 8,000 health, so they're basically just like a, a normal elite. Before I forget to mention, there are two of these stones per camp, so make sure that you go to each of the two stones, and then you can just move on to the next camp. Their respawns very fast. Mediums take a little bit to spawn, obviously large longer. You can, you know, pretty reasonable pretty realistically go to each camp, spawn the two, and then the next camp will be up before you, you know, do a full loop. So you should always have enough of these up, but you can run into competition if other people are also trying to get them at the same time. Next, we'll cover the two padding quests. So number nine and number 10 are going to be to kill groups of mobs. You can probably solo these as most classes, but I would recommend trying to have a couple people. Number 10 is going to be this Twilight Prophet. And so she runs with a gang of Avengers, and you basically just AOE farm them down. She will always run on the west side of Silithus, and so I highly recommend having the quest add on, guys, just to know exactly where these spawns are. It just makes it a lot easier. But she runs along the west side, so even if she's not on the place where it says that they spawn, definitely start running down the western side, run over to the camp, and if you don't see her, go back to the spawn place, and that's where she'll be next. But she will spawn over on the west side, drop the Twilight Battle Orders, and that will complete number 10. Number 9 is going to be Twilight Mardor Morna who also runs around with a bunch of these Twilight Maradars. And so this is going to be another one where there's a big pat that you basically have to, you know, run along the line of the pat, find the mobs, kill the mobs, quick and easy to take out. Now, I highly recommend, again, having Questy. It'll show you the exact path on the map to basically follow if you have that tactical assignment currently. So here you can see, for example, the line for number nine. 
they pat along all of these lines. And so it helps having two people because you could tell one to go on the north route, one on the south route, but basically you just run along this entire path until you find them. And then that is number nine. So number 10, western side of Silithus, number nine, right on this pathway right here. Six, seven, and eight require you to go into these different hives and basically try to find a hidden guy inside these hives. Long story short, if you go into the wrong entrance, you're just gonna run around and not be in the right place. And so fortunately I had somebody send me literally the Tom Tom waypoints basically on where to enter each one. I'm gonna show you exactly where to enter though so you guys don't have to worry about going into the wrong cave entrance and running around killing a bunch of elites and then not being able to go through. So this is number six, Hive Zora. You go into the northern section up here. Each one of these is going to have you basically loop around this like internal circle and then right after the circle is probably gonna be the mob. But you can see that each of these mobs have around 8,000 health and so especially if you're a prop pally or just a pally in general because pallies don't do a lot of damage in classic, it's gonna take a little bit to take out these mobs. Eventually though, we work our way through hugging that entrance and you can see right here is the mob. If you walk straight across, you can actually not aggro any of these mobs. Make sure you have an empty bag space and then you get the scouting report and that scouting report is what is gonna be turned in for the tactical badge. This is Hive Zora, Northern, Follow this pathway and right there. Hive Ashi is also going to be on the northern part. Don't accidentally run into the southern part like we did right there. It is up in the northern entrance, similar to Hive Zora. You're gonna be running that same kind of route right around to the right and you should be able to find that hidden guy. Now, hopefully there's some other people grinding over here. Maybe some people are grinding some carapaces like we found with this mage here. And that should hopefully save you a little bit of time. But you go into the, the northern section right here, hug the inside, go back along the left, always recommend hugging the left, and then you can talk to this guy right here and finish Hive Ashy. Last, we have Hive Regal. This is actually gonna be the southernmost entrance, so southern, southwestern Hive Regal. It honestly looks like it's off the map, so it looks like you're gonna have to go a really far away, but once you actually get into the cave itself, it's actually not too bad. Uh, it's just a little bit of a ways in. So hug the inner right side. You can see we're working our way in. We came through this cave entrance. Hug this pathway. There's honestly not too many mobs, and if there are you know, some along the way, they're typically tunnelers. Tunnelers won't actually aggro you unless you're currently killing another mob. They do have mind control though, so watch out if you're you know, not killing your friends and whatnot. Eventually though, you work your way into this open section right here, and then here is the guy. So it's not too bad, but Hive Regal is probably the longest run. Just hug the inner pathway on the right. And that is six, this is number seven, and Hive Ashi is number eight. So that's six, seven, eight. We've now gone over every single one of the tacticals outside of number five, which is the Dukes. So tactical number five is the four Dukes. And so we fortunately ran into this druid who actually needed to do some of the Dukes anyways, bought a bunch of the mats, but you can't get the mats off the auction house. And so it's not too bad. Uh, it doesn't cost too, too much to be honest. But then you come over to these medium stones. And so similar to the lesser stones before with the other elementals, the Dukes are a random spawn. You could get to the same Duke or all the same Duke through you know, four tries. And so you really got to have some good RNG, but each of the locations for the Twilight Guys has one of these medium stones. And so I recommend going to each of the locations. There will be a little bit of a wait once you get back to the first location to redo that Duke, that medium stone won't be up yet, but it shouldn't be too long of a wait. It took us about, you know, probably like three minutes of extra waiting. Otherwise you should be able to go from Twilight Camp to Twilight Camp to Twilight Camp. I do recommend having a full group for this, a tank and a healer and three DPS. They do hit pretty hard. If you can't get that, you know, try to have a, at least hopefully you're a paladin so you can heal yourself, but there's going to be a lot of healing going out that you're probably going to need. And there's going to be a lot of damage you guys are going to be taking. I don't have great gear, obviously, but you can see that I almost did just die with that Duke. So hopefully you guys get good RNG with the Dukes, but once you kill all four of them, then you can get the Mark of Scenarius, which is one of the biggest parts of the quest itself. So after you finish the tacticals, you can move on to logistics or combats. I'm gonna show you the combats first and I would recommend doing them just to clean up your quest log. At this point, obviously we wanted to have all four quests for each combat location accepted. So that's 12 quests in our quest log that we're trying to burn through. And so it's probably just easier if you get rid of those quests rather than just having them sit there when you're trying to get all the logistics quests again. So for the combat quests, you have to go into each of the three caves, Zora, Ashy and Regal and burn down the mobs. If you did enough of the fields of duty where you're able to grind up a bunch of these dossiers that you get, 
you would be able to just farm the same cave. And that's pretty much what we did. And so the way it works is you do field duty, you get a dossier which contains all four quests for a given hive. So Hive Zora, Regal, or Ashy. And then you can accept those quests, do those quests, turn them all in, and then just open up another dossier, re-get all those quests, go back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about the caves a little bit and which ones you might want to prioritize. Regal has a couple mobs that do fears, or sorry, not fears, mind controls. And so what they'll do is they'll actually mind control one of your players in your group and then become a pain in the butt because then that person is also damaging you and you can't heal them. Hyper Eagle kind of sucks. I'm going to be honest. You also have some stealth mobs around there, which are ambushing you. And then you also have Regal Lords, which aren't even part of the quest, but are mobs that are there, which you could potentially pull. So you might be killing excess mobs for no good reason while also getting mind controlled. And it's just not a good time. So I wouldn't recommend Regal as your main focus. Hive Ashi has one of the quests in which you have to kill mobs that are mainly outside the inst or outside of the individual caves. They're kind of a pain. I'm gonna be honest. Like the majority of them are gonna be outside of the caves. You're gonna to have to kill them one by one. There's gonna be no a AOE farming with it. So they kind of suck. So you're probably gonna end up skipping them. Then there's also the burrowers inside and the basically non-aggressive mobs. And ultimately there's just not as many of those as you'll find of the other mobs as well. So hi Vashi. You're probably only going to do three out of the four quests. And so it's not bad if you've already killed some for the Hive Ashi just to get through those three quests once. Same thing with Regal. But after that, I would focus on Hive Zora. So Hive Zora has Reavers, Waywatchers, Sisters, and then the Tunnelers. Now, the Tunnelers aren't as popular, again, because they're not aggressive. Once you aggro other mobs near them, they will become aggressive. So you just got to keep that in mind. But the rest of the mobs are plentiful. And what you can do is what, what we're doing here. You can round up multiple of these mobs and AoE farm them down. Now, right now, they are elite mobs, so they have double the health of the normal mob that they would have. But in pre-patch, they will be non-elite mobs, or they should be non-elite given the fact that it should be 2.4.3. So it should actually be very easy to grind through them. And I personally tested this out on the pre-patch, and it was very easy to grind through you know, four or five mobs at once and solo the quest in the combat series in a couple of hours. Obviously that's not too fast, but a couple of hours is a heck of a lot better than around the seven or eight hours of grinding these mobs that we probably had to put in just to get 450 mobs down for the combat quests. The way that I recommend doing this guys is there's three individual caves in Hive Zora. I recommend bouncing between the caves, aggroing up three to four mobs at a time, and then burning them down. One area you're also going to find inside the caves is these kind of X-like shape central locations, which have two mobs in each of the corners of the X's. And so what you could do is if you have a ranged person in your group, and I recommend grouping up for these quests, they can aggro those mobs, go to the middle, pop into vulnerability, such as ice block, for example, all the mobs will come stand on them. And then you can just AOE farm them down. And so that's going to be the most efficient way to kind of roll through these combat quests. Again, group up. Do Hive Zora and try to AoE multiple of them at once. Once you finish Hive Zora, turn it back in, run back down, do them all over again. Honestly, I wouldn't worry about finishing the Tunnelers every single time. Maybe do the Tunnelers every other time just because they aren't as good. But here you can see one of those X sections. So we have the X right here. We could go into each of the sides, aggro up all these mobs, bring them all to the middle, and then AoE from them down if we had enough people. And so here I think we actually got a bunch of them at once. I think I think around six, and I'm not even paying attention, obviously, <laughs> but you're able to burn through the quest pretty quickly. So the combats aren't too bad. We'll just require some grinding, but like I said before, pre-patch should make them be non-elites, which is going to make it be a lot easier. So now that we finished the combat and the tacticals, we are ready for the last kind of briefing, which is going to be the logistics. Now the logistics are different from the combat and the tacticals in that you don't need to kill any mobs. You don't need to go into any of the hives. In fact, you don't really do anything in Silithus. Instead, what you do is you bring items to Silithus as part of the war effort. So you're going to bring them either to Scenarian Hold, or you're going to bring them to the actual place where you killed the bigger bug to for field duty. What I recommend doing is trying to stack up about 10 logistics tasks before you get started. Now there's multiple reasons for this, but the main reason is the fact that each of these is gonna require you to bring items. And so if you're gonna go get those items from the auction house, which most people are gonna do, it's gonna to suck to have one logistics quest, go to the auction house, get that, come back, go back, go back. and You could just spend so much time going back and forth. If you get 10 of these though, what you can do is you can get all those items at once, come back, turn them all in, you get 10 follow-ups, go back, 
And if you get lucky with the follow-ups that you get and the initial quests that you have as well, you could in theory knock them out in two trips. And so it could be very, very easy. Granted, you probably won't get very lucky with the logistics tasks that you do get. And so it probably will take three to four trips. But if you get lucky, it could take you as little as about 20 minutes to do all this. I probably would estimate that it's going to take between 30 minutes and an hour, though, to knock out the logistics. There are a couple logistics that I would recommend skipping. That is going to be number six and number two. Number two requires that you go and find Orny Mithra boots and three of them. Number six requires that you get Moonsteel broadswords. Both of these are the same kind of idea where I believe that these are only really used for this quest or maybe another quest. And so you're, there's not going to be many of them in the auction house. And so they're probably going to be expensive for one, if there are any on the auction house. So they're going to be pretty difficult to do these. I personally got a ton of twos as follow-ups. And so I had to drop them all. I think I got like four in a row at once at some point, but I would recommend just dropping number six and number twos. The rest of them though, as long as they're not too expensive on your server, are probably pretty good to do, and I would try to knock out as many of them as possible. And so what I actually did was I put together this Excel, and I'm going to have this in the description down below so you guys can go ahead and you can copy or save this Excel from the Google Doc and then put it in, put in all your own information, and it'll automatically help you guys as well. But basically what this does is is an Excel with all of the individual items that you will need for these quests, pre-populated with the quantity that you will need, and the logistics number. And then there's a formula that basically just says, if I have this logistic, tell me how many I need. And then down at the bottom, we can have the total required for the individual logistics. So for example, if we were to have two fives, three fours, and four ones, the formula would automatically say, okay, with this four, we need six oils of immolation. With this four, we need six oil of immolation. This four, we need six oil of immolation. And so it'll tell you that overall, you need 18 oil of immolation. Similarly, goblin rocket fuels, then for my logistics number five, well, we have two of them. So we need two large brilliant shards, two large radiant shards, two huge emeralds. And so if you populate this with all the numbers that you have in your bags that you want to do, even if you include number sixes and number twos, etc., this will tell you at the bottom how many of each of the items you need to grab from the auction house. That way, when you go to the auction house, all you have to do is look at this Excel, say, okay, I need X number, switch over to the auction house, buy those items, and then you have all the items in your bag, go back to Silithus, turn them all in, get new logistics, go back to the auction house, buy the new items that you need, and you can just go back and forth and back and forth. So as I said, this will be down in the description down below in a Google Doc that you guys can basically save and use for yourself. Now, what's the fastest way to go from Silithus back to Stormwind or Org, back to Silithus, et cetera? The fastest way that I found was we set our hearths to Silithus, and then we had a mage be parked there. It could actually even be your own mage on your own account as long as you can port. Because what you can do is you can get somebody to invite your mage, invite your paladin, log off your mage, log on your pally, invite your paladin, make it a raid group. And then as long as you guys stay in the group, you can actually port and then log on to your paladin and take that same port while the mage is offline, as long as you stay in a group. And actually, it doesn't even need to be a raid group. You just have to stay in that group the entire time. So you can do this all by yourself. Then once you get the mats, you could hearth back to Silithus, turn them all in, get another port, go back, and be good to go. Now, how do you get back once you have your hearth? Well, you can go over to RFC or Stockades, go into the instance, leave the group, and that will automatically hearth you to your hearth location after about a minute and a half. So even if your hearthstone is on cooldown, because Stormwind and Org have a dungeon inside the actual city, you'll be able to very easily get back. And you could just bounce back and forth just like that, get all the mats that you need, go back to Silithus, turn them all in, and go back and forth like that. If you need to get a leather worker or something like that to basically make some of the items for you, you can also look and look for group and try to find a leather worker. But overall, the tacticals aren't bad at all. There is no real benefit of these in pre-patch. If anything, it's probably a detriment waiting till pre-patch for these just because more people will probably be doing these quests which means that they will then be more difficult to actually finish. All right, so we have finally finished all of the tacticals, all the logistics. We have our Mar Marcus Scenarius. We finished the combat badges. The only thing left to do is to get the reputation. There's three different ways to get the reputation, and it's actually going to be much easier in pre-patch. And so I want to talk to you guys about that, especially since a lot of you are probably going to have a Horde Paladin that you're trying to work on. The first way is to do the quest in Silithus. Now, the quest in Silithus will give you about 50 reputation each. If you're a human, you get 55. 
it's going to take a long time and you're going to run out of quests before you're exalted for sure. Another way is to run AQ20 and AQ40. AQ40 will give you some Scenarian Circle rep. AQ20 will give you the bulk of it, and that'll be about 2,000 rep per each of the runs. The third way is to turn in these Encrypted Twilight Texts. Now, currently, Encrypted Twilight Texts give 100 reputation each turn in. And so to go through the 42,000 reputation from Neutral to Exalted, for example, it would take you 4,200 turn ins, or sorry, Encrypted Twilight Texts to go through, and so 420 turn-ins. Obviously, that is going to be pretty expensive considering that they are about one gold each. So that's about 4,200 gold to do this right now. However, in 2.4.3, in TBC, they changed the way that Scenarian Circle reputation works alongside some other reputations. Specifically, they doubled the reputation that they gave. Some quests, however, gave even more reputation, such that Encrypted Twilight Text actually gives you 500 reputation per turn in. So instead of giving 100 right now, it gives you 500 reputation, which means that you could go from neutral to exalted with roughly 800 Twilight Texts. Obviously this is gonna save a lot of gold, and so this is a fantastic way to try to get to exalted. It means you don't have to run a Q20. It does suck that it's still 800 gold, which is not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but it is far better than what it currently is with 4,000 of these. And so the pre-patch is really going to help. If you don't want to buy them, though, you can still run AQ20. You'll be able to get reputation twice as fast as you currently can. Or you could do AQ40, or you could do quests and things like that. And you'll get bonus reputation through all those other methods as well. But I personally find that it's going to take a lot longer to get to Exalted through all those methods than it would be doing this. My recommendation would be do the reputation as the very last thing that you can do, because if you do the combat badges, if you do the logistics, if you do the tacticals, you do all the field duties, that alone right there, especially in pre-patch, will probably net you about seven to 8,000 a rep before pre-patch, probably about four to 4,000 ish kind of rep just from those quests alone. You'll also be killing some of the Geolord Twilight guys as you're doing some of the elementals for tacticals and stuff, so you'll also get rep from them. So you'll, you'll probably end up getting about nine to 10,000 rep, I would say, while doing the actual quest from everything that you're doing. And so you can automatically take out some of the Twilight text you would need just by doing that. Once you finish all these, then you turn in the Twilight text, but then once you finish all that, you're finally ready to turn in the quest and get the Wrath of Scenarius. Hopefully this guide helps you. There's some changes I'm going to show you guys right now with the pre-patch. Obviously, we just talked about the rep, but there's some other changes as well, which are going to make it a little bit easier. But hopefully, everything in this guide helps you guys figure out how to get this as quickly as possible. The Wrath of Scenarius is 100% worth it. I've been testing it on the, on the beta, and our Consecrates are doing up to 185 damage a tick, and it ticks eight times. That's insane. That is so much damage. And so I highly recommend putting in this grind. It's not going to be the most fun, but it is 100% going to be worth it when you're AOE farming various dungeons in pre-patch and then also throughout TBC. So now let's real quickly talk about some changes in the pre-patch that are going to make this quest and the entire quest line so much easier. So first off, you're getting a lot more reputation from various quests. And so for example, you can do a quest called The Calling Now. Now, there's two big benefits of the changes to this quest. First, this quest is formerly a raid quest, but because of the changes to the Silithus mobs, this is no longer an elite. Well, yeah, he's still technically a boss, but he's a lot easier. He only has 13,000 health. You don't need a raid group anymore, so you can actually solo the calling quest. The calling quest gives you 500 rep. And so, for example, if you were to do this quest after the pre-patch, that alone would be the equivalent of a Twilight Text turn-in, saving you 10 gold. So the quests are just going to give you a lot more rep, and it's going to be a lot easier to farm up the rep through questing if you want to save some gold on the Twilight Text turn-in. Obviously, though, the Twilight Text turn-in also gets multiplied to 500 rep per turn-in, so that's going to be an insanely fast way to get reputation. Another really nice quality of life change is that the Hive Zora Abomination, this big mod that you have to kill, only has 122,000 life. Now, currently, he has about 366,000 life, so they basically just did one-third of the life 
that this guy has. He also obviously dies a lot faster because of this, but he also does less damage. And so you're actually able to even tank him. And it's pretty easy for most classes to be able to solo him, let alone paladins who can heal themselves. You can see that he's only hitting me for about 284 and I'm just spamming Consecrate just to burn him down as quickly as possible. So he's going to make him dying much, much easier is going to make it a lot easier to stack up a lot of tacticals, a lot of logistics, and a lot of combats so that you can stay in Hive Zora for combats. For logistics, you only have to make a couple trips. And then for tacticals, you can knock out a bunch of tacticals, including all of the elementals, at one given time rather than having to go, you know, back and forth with four tacticals at a time or something like that. So this is going to make it a lot easier. And then the last quality of life change is just that the Hive Zora, Hive Avashi, Hive Regal, all those mobs are now non-elites. So not only is it easier to get to the tactical mobs if you're going into the caves to turn in the quest, but these guys are also going to be a lot easier to kill. So for example, here I round up five mobs, and one of them is a sister's, which is still over there casting. But you can see they only have about 3,900 health, which is much less than they have now. It's about 8,500-ish, somewhere around there. And you can see that I can just mow them down with Wrath of Scenarius, with Pop of My Toe Up, I'm pulling about 350 DPS, a lot more than that actually because I was rounding up the mobs for part of it. And so you're just really easy, really easily able to take them down and you don't lose much health in the process. That's five mobs. And so I have to do that 90 times to finish the combat quests. And I didn't even get close to dying. I didn't have to heal once. And so it's just a lot easier to burn down combats. If you get a full group of people together, the only thing that's going to slow you down is the respawn time of the mobs and potential competition on your realm for other people doing this quest. So just try to group up as much as possible. The tactical missions themselves are going to be a lot easier. But the downside of this technically is that if more people are doing the Wrath of Scenarius, there will be more competition. So try to make sure that you use general chat and things like that to try to group up with people to actually be able to efficiently kill the mobs rather than be competing for the mobs. But pre-patch should make this so much easier. I think with all of these things combined, I think that the combat quests themselves will take about two hours, maybe an hour and a half if you're very efficient to burn through all the combat badges that you need. The tactical badges will also take about two hours and then logistics will take about one hour. The rep itself is just a turn in. Overall, I think that you could finish the Wrath of Scenarius quest in about six hours played, which is much better, much, much better than the current 20 plus hours that it takes right now. So 100% worth whatever kind of investment you can get, especially after pre-patch for your paladins to try to get Wrath of Scenarius. As I said, when it procs, you have an additional 15 damage on each of your consecrates. And when you're doing the big AOE pools, you're almost gonna have 100% uptime. You can see it even proc just off those five mobs right there. So it is 100% gonna be worth picking up and grinding for with TBC.